Welcome to Timbrose Church's Faith University. The title of this lesson is Blessing of Forgiveness and New Life. Let us pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you, Lord. We bless you, Father, and we, Lord Jesus, come to you, Father, looking for your guidance. We thank you, Father, for being able to come to you through the lessons, Father, that you have put together for us, Lord. We bless you and we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. The scripture lesson text comes from 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 10, and chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. The golden text comes from chapter 1, verse 9, and the scripture reads, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and shown unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us that which we have seen and heard declared unto you, that ye may also have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Chapter 2 verse 1 reads, My little children, these things I write unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is in propitiation of our sins and not for our, not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. And thereby we do not know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that said it, I know him and keep it not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whosoever keepeth his word in him verily is love, is the love of God perfected, whereby no we have, we are in him. The word of the Lord is blessed. For people to enjoy fellowship, we need to have things in common. The very word fellowship means to have in common. Our God is holy and we are sinners. Our God is infinite and we are finite. Our God is eternal and we are temporal. What could we possibly have in common with a transcend with God? How could we ever fellowship with him? Is that even possible? In this week's lesson, we will explore issues relating to our fellowship with God of the undescribable light and righteousness. In this lesson is broken into three sections. The first section is the manifestation of the word. The second section is the practice of walking in the light. The third section is the test of knowing Christ. Section one, manifestation of the word. And we'll start off with verse one and verse one reads, that is which from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. And this scripture was written by the Apostle John and possibly dated somewhere between A.D. 90 and 95, probably making it he probably wrote this prior to his his exile at Patmos, 
which he wrote in Revelations as one of the 12 disciples and one of the three in the inner circle of the Lord, the apostle God had also known Jesus intimately. He had been with him from the beginning of his ministry and stayed with him throughout the end. As mentioned in verse one, he had seen, heard, and touched him, for Jesus Christ was a man in human flesh. Verse number two, for the life was manifested as we have seen it and bear witness and shown in and shown into you that eternal life, which was with the father was manifested unto us. In this scripture, the apostle John emphasizes the humanity of Jesus Christ because of false teachings that was affecting the churches. During the second century, Gothic became prominent and teaching was a matter of, of evil, which was not only, which was, which was that was fiercely good. Section one, the manifestation of the word. We start in verse one and it reads, that which was from the beginning, which we had heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we had looked upon and our hands had handled the word of life. And this scripture was written by the Apostle John, which was probably dated somewhere AD between 90 and 95. It was probably written prior to the Apostle's exile on Patmos, where he wrote Re Revelations. He was one of the 12 disciples and one of the three of the inner circle. The apostle John had known Jesus intimately. He had been with him from the beginning of his ministry and stayed with him throughout to the end. As mentioned in verse one, he had seen, heard, and touched him for Jesus was a man in human flesh. We go to uh, verse two and it reads, for the life was manifested we have seen it and bear witness and shown unto you that eternal life which was with the Father was manifested unto us. In this scripture, the apostle emphasizes the humanity of Jesus because of the false teachings that was affecting the churches during this period. The apostle states that the eternal word of life directly comes from the Father which was manifested among them. In, this, in, this, in that scripture, the word we and us refers to the apostles. They in turn declared exactly what they had witnesses. They had no doubts in their mind that Jesus was the eternal son of God, which was manifested into human flesh. The apostle was well qualified to teach about Jesus. He had been one of those eyewitnesses to everything that Jesus had done throughout his ministry. The apostle John's readers had not seen Jesus, but per seen Jesus personally, but they could rely on his testimony. As we go down to verse three, it reads, that which we have seen and heard declared we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the father and his son jesus christ so in this verse the apostle paul has 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 um, verse four and these things we write to you that your joy may be full that your joy may be full understanding about christ was a source of true joy. Apostle John was concerned about the welfare of his readers, knowing that they could not experience full joy as long as they were struggling with doubt, uh, with doubt, and especially created by false teachers. At this time, in this period, there was a lot of false teaching going on, and John was concerned with that. Now we drop down to section two the practice of walking in light. 
and we start with verse 5. And verse 5 reads, This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. The Apostle John already mentioned that he and the other apostles had heard Christ. Now he's specific on what message that came from him. It was simply that God is light and there was no darkness in him. Darkness and light represents two extremes. Light stands for what is good, pure, holy, and righteous. Darkness stands for what is sinful, evil and false light shines in evil light shines and reveals while darkness hides and covers in his very nature in moral character god is complete light darkness cannot touch him verse 6 if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness we lie and we do not tell the truth. In this scripture here, the Apostle John is explaining that walking in darkness should be completely foreign to us. The Apostle wrote, if we claim to be in fellowship with God, but walk in darkness, we are only lying. Walking in darkness indicates the presence of continual sin in our lives. We are God's children and must recognize that we cannot enjoy fellowship with God in the way he intended if we allow sin in our lives. Verse 7, but if we walk in darkness as he is in light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ of the Son cleanses all sin, cleanses us from all sin. In this scripture, the apostle John wrote, what happens when we walk in light, when we live constantly obedient, pure lives before God, when we live the way we are living God's way in Jesus Christ. Since Jesus is truly God, it is just as true of him that is as true of the Father that there is no darkness. His entirety is pure and holy and cannot be morally affected by sin or evil. When we walk in the light, we compare ourselves to Jesus who is in light constantly. In the conclusion, that is, when we walk in light, we walk as Jesus in the light. We and God have fellowship with one another. This is even more meaningful when we walking in fellowship with other believers, as wonderful as that is, we live constantly in the light that's provided through Jesus' word and experience constant fellowship with our heavenly, heavenly Father. Verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, the tr and the truth is not in us. Amen. Total obedience to God should not be an option we entertain, but a choice that we make because we love him. We do not need to recognize that because we do need, we need to recognize that because we are humans, we cannot be perfect. To claim perfect holiness would to be to live a lie. Cleansing, the cleansing power, the cleansing blood of Jesus, however, is, an, is available to cover every sin. We confess to him. Verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is the key verse in the lesson. And in this scripture, John wanted his readers to know that even though people sin and cannot help doing so because they have 
In this scripture, the Apostle John wanted his readers to know, even though people sin and cannot help doing so because of their failing nature, God has provided means which we can still fellowship with him. It comes through confession, which means to acknowledge or to acknowledge something. God wants to give us, forgive us for our sins. That's why he sent his only son to die for us. We will struggle with sin, and when we commit sin, he wants us to agree with him that we've done something wrong. We know this by the conviction of his spirit. Verse 10. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. In this scripture, the apostle also said that we must confess our sin. God cleanses us of all. If we confess our sin, God cleanses us of all unrighteousness. He does not, he does this because he is faithful to all his promises that he has made about his willingness to do so. And you can find that reference in Colossians 2 and 13. Furthermore, all of his promises are legit because he is a just God. He does everything in accordance to what is right or righteousness. The death of Jesus Christ had provided moral grounds upon which God can forgive all of them, all of all who receive him. He does this not to be to be unjust when he forgives us. Although we become new creatures upon being saved, you can find this in 2 Colossians chapter 5 and 17, possess a new nature and we still live not yet redeemed bodies of flesh. And we still live in these yet redeemed bodies of flesh. That is why sometimes we sin as Christians. And you can find more references in Romans 8 and 7, chap Romans chapter 7, verses 14 to 25, for an explanation of the Apostle Paul in the continuance of presence of unredeemed flesh. We're going to drop down now to section 3, the test of knowing Christ, the test of knowing Christ. And it starts on in the second chapter verse number one, and verse number one reads, My little children, these things I write unto you, that ye sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. In this scripture, the apostle John was very old when he wrote this letter, and he thought of his readers as children in the Lord. He was concerned that they understood what sin was, understand that sin was a constant threat to them. Just as any parent, we would be concerned about the dangers of threatening our children. The Apostle John had the same concern. He wanted them to know that since sin he wanted them to know that since we are, we will not be sinless while we're in these present bodies, God has provided us with an advocate to give us help that we desperately need. An advocate is somebody who comes along to speak in the defense of one in need. We're going to drop down to chapter, excuse me, verse 2. Verse 2, and he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. In this verse, Jesus intercedes for us when we sin. For he's already paid the price for those sins. As the Father recognized this truth, he's completely satisfied by this arrangement. The word propitiation in verse 2 means that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross satisfies the demands 
of God's holiness to punish sin. Verse 3. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. In this verse, a person who claims to be Christian but has no concerns about obeying God is lying according to the Apostle John. In fact, the truth is not in him at all. When a person receives Jesus Christ as a personal savior, major changes take place in his heart. Worldly desires do not control him. The key word in this verse is keep, and the Greek words means to guard. As Christians, we must con we must keep we must keep in mind God's commandments, then live by them. Ignoring them indicates we do not know him. In verse 4, it reads, He that said it, I know him, and keep not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. In this verse, those who do not practice obeying God's word gives evidence that they have not received Jesus Christ as their personal savior. They are, with, they are living according to Satan's desires. Satan has no truth in him and is nothing but a murderer and a liar. And you can find that reference in John verse chapter 8, verse 44. Even though we fail often, we still are God's children. If you listen carefully to the Holy Spirit and follow his leading, you can become a victorious Christian. Amen. Verse 5. But those, but whoso keepeth his word, in him is the love of God perfected, hereby known that we are, excuse me, hereby know we that are in him. The ability to obey God comes from the love of God more deeply. Hallelujah. If it is our love that becomes perfected, that we will never fail in the efforts to defeat sin. But our love should mature as we grow in the understanding of God and his ways. We'll never achieve the absence of total, total absence of sin as long as we live in these fleshly bodies. We should know, however, we find ourselves becoming more sensitive to God's will as we grow and more responsive to confessing our sins, the need to confess our sins. Maturing as a Christian, we will lead to the sensitivity and enable us to be more, to maintain a more fellowship with God as we live according to the spiritual light given to us our joy in him will increase. Amen. In today's lesson, we examine a passage from 1 John that deals with our fellowship with God. We learn to affirm true fellowship with God. The God of light is possible through Christ. And we can use this lesson to encourage Christians to appreciate and cultivate their experience with God by walking by life. The key here is to, we have an advocate who's rooting for us. We have a God that walks with us. He wants to walk with us in fellowship. And we must restrain from from doing things and not obeying what his will is. Lord, we thank you and we praise you, Father. We thank you for sharing with us your word on today, Lord. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for we, we pray that this lesson encourages someone today, Lord, that there is an opportunity for fellowship. There's opportunity for forgiveness, Father. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives. We thank you for what you're doing in the kingdom and how you're using us, Father, to move through 
your word, Lord Jesus. We come praying unto you today that you have our way in our lives, Lord Jesus, and this lesson touches somebody in need. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.